Hey, my name is Ilya Tobas. I'm the Artistic and Managing Director. Thrilled to have you all here. And of course, also Danny Menken, uh, who, for those that don't know, he's a two-time Israeli Academy Award-winning filmmaker, uh, first for 39 Pounds of Love, and then also Is That You? Um, is uh, 39 Pounds of Love was sold to HBO and was shortlisted for the Oscars. And uh, his film Dolphin Boy, which also played at our festival, was sold to over 20 countries around the globe, bought for Disney by an, uh, for the adaptation. Um, on the map, which you may have seen and obviously has some, some overlap with this story, though this story goes in a different way with Alsi, um, was uh, played at our festival and we actually had Donnie in person for that, which was a wonderful time um, and went on to be distributed by Lionsgate. And so we're thrilled to have Donnie here, a very um, influential and well-known documentary and storytelling uh, filmmaker. Donnie, thank you so much for joining us and, and welcome. Well, a pleasure being with you again, Elia, this time virtual, hopefully next time in person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's just jump into it. And before we do, I'll just give kind of the really quick housekeeping notes, um, two housekeeping notes. The first is for the audience that's here, we have audiences that are sort of segmented into two places. You're all saying the same thing. So don't worry about missing out on the other <laughs> virtual rooms. You can either do this through Eventive or through Zoom. Um, either way, please, if you're in Zoom, use the Q&A function uh, rather than the chat function to ask questions or if you're in Eventive, just use the uh, single chat function there and we'll catch the questions. I'll incorporate them throughout. So feel free, to, you know, kind of right off the bat when you have questions, put them in. I'm going to start with a couple of my own, but mostly leave it uh, to the audience and, and Danny to connect. Um, so we'll start here kind of with, uh, with the easy softball one, not that they're going to get too much harder, but what drew you to this story? I know you have a personal connection to Alsi Perry as a player and you idolized him as, as a kid. Can you tell us a little bit, especially because of just how multidimensional his personal tale is, at what point did you know you needed to make this film? Yeah, I mean, the, the point that I, I knew I needed to make the film is since I became a filmmaker and uh, I started actually in sport. That's where my career started. And, and, and everybody in Israel was a big fan of Maccabi at the time, as I show in the movie, there was just one channel. So when Olsi Perry is coming uh, after he doesn't make it to the Knicks, he's the last guy to be cut from the Knicks, and he's bringing the country to glory, as I showed him on the map, and a little bit, I showed it also in Olsi, to those who haven't watched the first part, let's call it, uh, Olsi Perry became an icon. And then he became an icon, not only on the sports section, but it also came to the life section, let's call it the uh, entertainment section when he was the, uh, you know, the, the face of the country together with Tammy Benami. They were really the power couple of the country. Uh, the Brajolina, if we, if we want to say, of Israel. And that's how um, Ossi Perry for nine years uh, won the, Israel, the, the European Championship. He won again uh, in, in 81. And uh, everybody adored him until um, something happened and twisted the story. I knew that I wanted to make the story when Olsi came back and I was chasing after him for 20 years. All of those who watch the movie can understand why Olsi um, had some holdups in, in telling that story. And I had to chase after him and convince him to do it. And luckily at some point he said, yes, I will do it. And if there will be somebody that I'll do it with, it will be you. And, uh, and then my journey started. So I'm curious, you mentioned, um, obviously he had this outsized fame in Israel, both on the court and also as a cultural and a pop icon eventually as well, dating a supermodel, uh, et cetera. Did people other than you, who obviously was, was personally very interested, did people in Israel follow his life after um, his glamour on the court or, or was it a little bit lesser known? And similarly, I have to say as an American that follows basketball, I knew very little about Alsi Perry though. I was not surprised about the Knicks uh, dropping him because they've made a ton of mistakes uh, over uh, their entire history. But did you find Americans are familiar with, with Perry in any sense before you made this film? And how about Israelis after his life on the court? Yeah, you know, I, I brought first on the map to the American audience because I was so surprised to see that the American audience knew nothing about the story. 
they knew nothing about Tal Brody. I had basketball icons like Jeff Van Gandhi and uh, Chris Weber telling me and uh, hosting me on, on, on their uh, webinar telling me, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a sports fanatic. I'm a basketball junkie. I never heard about this. So it was pretty exciting that people said, oh, we know everything about the Miracle on Ice, but we didn't know about your Miracle on Hardwood. So that's where also I knew that O.C. Perry has, as you mentioned, multi layers of story because he's an African-American and there is a biracial um, relationship here between him and Tommy, between him and the country, uh, that uh, this will be a very exciting story for me as an Israeli filmmaker that is uh, becoming in, in international uh, director to bring that story. It was pretty exciting for me to say, hey, you know, there is something I know and you guys, most of you don't know. And that's, um, that's the fun thing about uh, bringing stories that um, people here never heard about. For sure. And then uh, what about Israelis? Did they follow his life story after, you know, after he was in jail and that whole thing? Or did people kind of no longer uh, look at him in the same way? So, so let's start by saying in Israel, it's exactly the opposite. Everybody knows about On the Map. And when Tal Brody said those iconic words, it became like the 11th commandment. And of course, everybody knows about Olsi Perry and every, not only sports fan, every person knows that in many ways, he's the first African-American to come to Israel. He's not, but in the, their image, he is. And uh, he really made the big breakthrough for all the foreign players that came after that uh, to play in Israel. Many of them even stayed. But the fact that he became Israeli, he became Jewish, he uh, made him really uh, a big story. I will say, like Alexander Wolf from Sports Illustrated mentioned in the movie, he says it's like Karim Abdul-Jabbar and Michael Jordan roll into one. Uh, with the achievement and everything. And I would even say in Israel, I can argue that he's bigger than all those because he really changed the country. That team changed the country. So that's kind of how Israel saw it. And when he fell, when he didn't come to one of the games that everybody is watching, so everybody started to talk about what happened to Olsi, really what happened to Olsi. But Olsi was embarrassed with... Um, with, with the fact that he was addicted to drugs and he did not want to talk about it. And Israel respected it. Israel gave him space and never, they never chased, oh, I'll see, please tell us what, what happened. The only thing that Israel wanted him is to come back home. I mean, they, they missed the lost, the lost son. And that's how Israel saw him. Israel saw him, oh my gosh, he is ours now. And where is he? And if he's in jail, we need to help him and we need to bring him back home. Uh, so that's kind of the way Israel audience saw it. And that's how it's really fascinating to see the American audience uh, see this story. Absolutely. So I had a question that sort of bridges um, your approach as a storyteller and a documentarian. And, and I've talked with you before and I've, I've seen interviews before where you don't draw too much of a line between being a documentarian and a narrative film. Like you, you tell stories. Um, and what's so incredible is the story of Alsi's life that you found. But I also imagine on the flip side, it is a challenge because there are so many layers to it. It's a story about a glamorous lifestyle. It's a story about sports. It's a story about national heroism. It's a story about drug use. It's a story about cancer. I mean, it just goes on and on of finding his daughter. Can you talk about, obviously that's compelling and it pulls you in, but what is the challenge for you there? How do you meld all of those elements? How do you align all of those threads so that you have a single compelling narrative, which this film very much ended up being? I think you did yeah. a tremendous job, but that, that's a challenge as a storyteller. How do, how do you manage all of that? So for me, I started uh, approaching Olsi by telling him that I want to make the narrative movie about him, and I still am, and I, and I am in the process of writing the, the script, but I, I always had the outline version of the screenplay that I'm about to to write uh, about Olsi. So in that way, I felt pretty comfortable. 
what happens is that also at some point tells me about the daughter that I, have, I had no idea, nobody in Israel knew that he has a daughter that he hasn't seen for 20 years and he wants to reach out to her. And part of his incentive was he wants her to know about the story from his own, on, from his own words. And that's kind of what was um, his trigger to make it happen. So I wanted to make the film like Olsi Perry in many ways is telling it to his daughter because that's what he told me. He said, look, I, wanna, I want her to know about it. And the first thing he did is told her a lot of, a lot, a lot about what he went through. Because I said he said it. I don't want her to learn it from Wikipedia or from Google. So that was part part one. The other thing is that when you're making a film about one person, so he's becoming kind of the glue to the to the story. You're right to say there are so many layers. There is a father and son. There is a father and daughter. There is a there is a basketball player in the country, there is drug abuse, there is, there is addiction. There are so many layers. Um, and one of the best characters I feel in the movie was Shabluk, uh, the, fa the father figure of, of um, Olsi, the one that Olsi comes back to see. And with all that said, I haven't mentioned the, the incredible love story that he had with Tammy and think about it, that he's going back to see Shabluk, but he's really saying goodbye to Tammy. Uh, all those things, you know, were almost too good to be true. And when you put them together and there is one character, so it's kind of like a, a roller coaster journey. And I wanted to capture the journey that he faced. I think I had even a bigger challenge with On the Map because On the Map doesn't have one big character. It has Tal Brody, but it doesn't have, it has the character of the team, it has the character of the country and that roller coaster. But I'm very comfortable when I have one character and I can lean into him. And I thought always that it's a big story of redemption. So I always had that in mind, that everything is about redemption and everything is about also really finding his family. So when he's reaching out to his daughter and in many ways he's fixing his relationship with his son, he's fixing, fixing his relationship with the country. Uh, he's really trying to bring back uh, and find the family that he hasn't had. And that's one of the things that he has learned by becoming an Israeli. Absolutely. So we're going to turn to audience questions in a minute, but I, I did want to talk a little bit about um, race as a factor here. And something that was very compelling to me about the story is the sense of being a belonging somewhere or being an outsider somewhere. And it's not always where you expect. You have Israel that takes him in with open arms. Um, right. And you have Newark, which he's essentially escaping uh, originally with the thought that it'd be to the NBA and then to a country and, and a system that he had barely heard of in Israel. Um, what do you make of his race, particularly in how it might have been perceived differently in the US and Israel? Um, because the, there seemed to be, it, it's something that you, you definitely dealt with in the film, but because it's such a positive story, um, I, I feel like you didn't hover on it too, too much. Um, but as somebody that was in Israel at the time and grew up idolizing him, could you tell us a little bit about the difference about how his race was perceived uh, in Israel differently than perhaps in the US? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually started the movie with, with that. As you said, there are so many other layers to it, but I, I, I had to start with the fact that, you know, Olsi was, raised with racism you know he was beaten uh, he was in newark you know when there was the uprising his family suffered from racism his master you know uh, beat them and uh, his family had to escape from not too far from you guys from north carolina mm -hmm. and uh, so that was something that really really was with him and actually still is with him until today uh, but when he came to Israel, immediately became an icon. And um, like Tal Brody likes to say, not only in sport, but in everything, because he was bringing the country pretty quickly to incredible glory. And then he was dating the top model of the country. So they became the darling of the country. So in Israel, he was never an African-American that suffered from racism and later had to face some big issues of addiction and crime. In Israel, he was and he is always um, number eight, Ossie Perry. 
Sounds good. Okay, I'm going to bring in a few audience questions here. Um, do please continue to put them in. Again, if you're on Eventive, um, you can just put them right into the chat, or if you're on the, the Zoom channel, put them into the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to start with one from Paula Kuhn. She says, after getting arrested in Amsterdam, how did Alsi end up in jail in North Carolina? And also, how long did he spend in jail before getting paroled? So Alsi was sentenced for 10 years. A lot of people say it's really long. <laughs> it, it, and uh, and on those 10 years, there was a big void for us, you know, for Israeli audience. In his life, there was one reporter that came to him. And when he did the piece about him, he mentioned where he is, the jail. And Olsi started to get hundreds of letters from Israel. And, but at that time, when Olsi separated from Israel, he finished his career with Maccabi. He separated also from Tami. And then at that point, and, you know, he was just... Uh, in the North Carolina jail in, in Butler, um, which I think is also not too far from you. Then there was a time that he was in parole. He uh, accidentally violated his parole. So he had to send, be sentenced for a little bit longer. And then when he was about to finish his sentence, he gets this request to come to Israel and, and uh, pay a tribute to Shamluk to surprise everyone. And the, this officer in jail says, are you kidding me? There is no way nobody will release you from jail before, from, from your sentence. He was still, he was in parole actually, but nobody will release you from the country uh, before the end of your, uh, of, of what you do. And, uh, and the people in Israel uh, wrote letters, uh, the Israeli consulate interfered and they, com they, they committed that Olsi will come back and then the same officer comes back to Olsi and says, I don't know who you know, but you are going to Israel. <laughs> and then he comes back to us. So you more or less addressed it, but Marjorie um, Kravitz, she asked about a little bit more information about how that release happened. She said, how did his parole officer get him released early? But it wasn't the parole officer, it was really the Israeli pressure that got the, the trip arranged, as far as I understand. Do you have any more sort of inside uh, baseball about how they actually manage that? Because it seems, yeah. I'm kind of with the parole officer here, it seems so implausible that yeah. he would be allowed out of the country. Yeah, yeah. There was, there was really a, a, a request from the country saying that he is somebody that affected the country uh, uh, very much. And they were also giving guarantees uh, that he will be back. And he did, you know, he will be back and he will finish his sentence. And, uh, you know, they gave him, they gave them, you know, a specific assurance that this will happen. Now, it's very unlikely that this will happen, but, uh, you see that some of the nice thing about Israelis when they really want something, they can push and they can press <laughs> and, uh, and they succeeded. That's, that's true, Israelis are, are very industrious people very uh, without question. Um, somebody else asks, it's uh, Labert Lubran asks, if you could give us a little bit more information about the relationship um, between Alsi and his son. And I think some others might also wanna know post film, uh, how's everything going with his daughter as well? Yeah, okay, so let's start with the son. The son lives actually not too far from you guys as well in Philadelphia. And, um, and their relationship is good. They had, they went through a lot, a lot of uh, hardships because Ossie um, decided in 1977 that he's not gonna be with his son, but he's going to be pursuing his career with Maccabi. And that's something that was sitting on his son. And when his son did come to Israel, and he found Olsi, you know, in, in, in a bit of a mess, you know, uh, the spotlight was on him pretty strongly. He was in relationship with Tammy then, but, you know, they were starting to do some bad things like drugs and everything. So uh, there are some baggage there. I showed it in the movie. And uh, I think that Olsi tried to fix it, not only by reaching out to his son and, and, and being in good relationship, but also to correct um, his fatherhood with his daughter, with Sierra. And uh, yeah, I mean, that was an incredible thing. I, I actually already cut the movie without that scene because you know, the mother asked for Olsi not to reach out now, but the daughter reached out to Olsi's sister 
and that lives in Pennsylvania. And uh, then Aussie came and, and they, they met. She's a wonderful girl. And uh, you know, uh, she's, uh, learn she's learning to be a nurse and they're waiting for Corona to be over. So she will go and visit uh, Israel because I don't know if it's clear from the movie, but Aussie lives now in Israel. Um, that actually goes to a question um, that we had from Martha Adler, specifically around that meeting with the daughter. And as you mentioned, it, you were already uh, beginning to do post-production on the film when, when you added that part of the story. She wants to know um, how that first meeting was shot. Uh, in other words, she says, were you able, how were you able to be there and film for that first meeting? Like how arranged was that? How did that yeah, come about? That was, that, that was not hard actually. I mean, because we, we told her, hi, I'm, I'm making a film about her, your father. She already knew uh, who who Ossie is and who he was. And uh, we came with the Ossie to, it was the house of his niece in uh, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And, uh, and we shot the meeting. The next thing we did <laughs> with her, which I don't show in the movie, is we showed her on the map. <laughs> Because also said, let's start with the good thing, with the good mm -hmm. stuff. So she saw, uh, she saw on the map, and uh, again, as I mentioned, she's a lovely girl, uh, very intelligent, and uh, also, also is, a, is a very proud, proud Jewish father, I would say. Absolutely. And for those that haven't seen, we've mentioned on map a few times. I know many of you have probably seen it at the festival. For those that haven't, it's a great companion piece and in many ways, of course, was, was considered this way. Um, it's Donnie. It was it your most recent, no, no, it's two films ago. Um, I think you make so many at this point, it's hard to keep track. Um, but on the map tells really the basketball story a little bit more, even though it, it brings in a little bit of the national pride as well. And um, also has a lot more of Todd Brody's story in there. It's a fabulous film about winning all these Maccabi championships, which was against all odds and nobody expected really, uh, perhaps other than the players themselves. Um, it's a fabulous film and highly recommend. Can we talk a little bit about the style? Um, and, and this is true of all your films, but I think in this one, there, there's a wonderful synthesis of your sort of artistic vision. It's not um, the kind of straightforward Q&A where it's just talking heads and it's remembrances. There's some of that. And I think it provides important context and history, but there's the animated bits, uh, the music and, and scoring I think is tremendous. Um, and, and just visually, it's a very evocative film. Can you talk about some of your artistic choices, sort of how you came to those, at what point the animation entered into your, your conception? Yeah, I mean, the animation came about when I saw that I do have a nice amount of uh, footage and archive. And after On the Map, I, I, I was really spoiled then. You know, I could really bring it to life because I found so many things that nobody's ever seen. Uh, with Olsi, I, I, I did find a lot of great uh, material, but for example, I was not there when uh, Olsi had the drug problems. I wasn't, nobody was there. And I wanted to bring that to life. I was not there. Nobody was there with him in jail. Nobody was there in many moments with Tommy. So we decided that we will bring uh, animation and in order for us to be able to be a documentary that is not just a, a talking head documentary. Uh, we have an anonymous question. It's pretty general, so feel free to take any direction. If you could give us just a little bit more information about his Jewish identity. Um, you talk about it, of course, in the film about how as he found a home in Israel, he became more interested. And then you even go back to where he was born in the Jewish hospital. But uh, if you could give us any more information about his Jewish identity and, and of course, living in Israel today. Yeah, I mean, he, he mentioned in the movie that when he was born in New York, New Jersey, Dr could make it, you know, his mother, um, uh, his mother couldn't make it to the hospital. And uh, they had to stop in the first hospital that there was there and was Beit Israel. So it was almost his destiny to, to come and to be a part of the country. He didn't know anything about Israel. When he came in 1977, he expected just camels. And there were some camels actually, but not in Tel Aviv. Uh, but he, he was very surprised, you know, to see that it's a real country. Uh, people are still surprised sometimes, even today. And then um, uh, after a year 
that he was in love with the country and the country was in love with him. And on top of that, he was in love with a Jewish girl. And it was an incredible biracial uh, relationship. And Olsi started to think about becoming uh, Jewish. So a lot of details I don't have besides the joke that Olsi mentioned in the movie that's from his brief the leather jacket for Tal Brody. <laughs> and uh, the fact that they changed his name. I don't know what's funnier to Elisha Ben Avram. <laughs> Even today, some people call him Elisha. And, but I will say this, that Olsi is very much Jewish in his uh, perspective, is, uh, you know, coming to the Sukkot and he's going to celebrate Hanukkah, he's going to synagogue, he's fasting in Yom Kippur, and, uh, and he lives in Israel until today. He has a Jewish uh, girlfriend for like 20 years. They're almost like married couple. He calls them his new family. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, they were on that uh, Skype call or, or Zoom or whatever it was. Yeah, they the were, end, yeah. yeah, I showed. I, I love that when they're being introduced to his daughter and uh, getting to know the whole family. Yeah, it's yeah. Beautiful scene. Come to Israel, come to Israel, you know, mm -hmm. how Israelis are. Yeah. Well, and I imagine that uh, hopefully after the vaccine is out and everything, that, that really will happen and the whole family. A lot of things should happen to... after the vaccine. Yeah, a, lot, waiting, a lot huh? of things, absolutely. <laughs> Um, all right. So as we get towards kind of wrapping up, I'd love to hear um, a little bit about responses. First off, what was Alsi's response to the film? Obviously, he had held on to the story and didn't want it made for so long. And you kept on pursuing it and we're all the better for it. What was his response when he first saw the completed product? First, first and foremost, he trusted me. So that was like something that I'm really thankful for him because there were some really hard moments. And sometimes I even had to tell him, Alsi, I need, I need to talk about the hard moments, not only about the glory. And the second thing is that um, when he sees it, you know, that's true for every documentary or every film about true event, you know, uh, there are some things that he loved. There are some things that were hard for him. Um, you know, he doesn't like to remember this, but I think it was very therapeutic to him and to receive the love from everyone uh, that have seen it. You know, he was, we did, before the corona, we had a big uh, premiere in Israel and we had a standing ovation from all the team, the family and everyone. So that was incredible. And so that's always a good sign, you know. Now yeah. the question is who's going to play Olsi in the narrative that we will do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, yeah, that's, uh, the next question was really about this film, but if you want to take it also to the narrative is, um, you know, beyond our festival, which continues, of course, through Thursday. And if, if you're on this Q&A and haven't seen it yet, you can watch it through the end of, uh, end of the week and definitely do. Um, but what's, what's kind of next for the film? Do you have distribution lined up? Is there a way uh, more broadly that you're hoping the, the film will be seen? Yeah, the film won a few uh, awards just before the corona and then it came and then we froze in it because nobody knew what's going on. So now we're doing some online screenings and then um, we will, of course, go for the normal uh, distribution on, uh, after we'll finish the festival. But we are not going to give up on a theatrical release and some more festival after we'll get this small needle that's supposed to change the world. Hopefully, in who knows when, and but I think you guys are making some changes over there in Washington in January twentieth. So we'll see <laughs> what will be the effect. But uh, everything supposed to be uh, different. So I, I really hope you know that uh, um, there is a good path for this film. If you liked it, please share it with everyone. If you want to be in touch with us, we're HeyJudeProductions.com. We are also a non-for-profit, so. Uh, everyone wants to help and support, uh, please feel free to do it. Please feel free to support the festival because without the festivals, uh, we don't have the platform to show our movies. If anyone will ever want a basketball signed by Olsi Perry and Tal Brody and Maccabi Tel Aviv basketball, uh, reach out to us through our website. Uh, maybe you guys can share Hey Jude Productions, like the Beatles song, heyjudeproductions.com. It's from the line of the Beatles, take a sad song and make it better. And that's part of what the Aussie Perry story is. You know, it's a story with a lot of bitter and a lot of sweetness. And, uh, and I hope at the end, you know, you all felt, you know, the redemption of this incredible character. 
Absolutely. And I would say if, if you haven't seen all of Donnie's films and in general, I hear so much of, you know, there's so many sad stories and so many sad tales and the news. It's all wrong. Like one thing that Donnie is doing that's amazing is all of his stories, even though they occasionally deal in some difficult subject matter, are positive at heart. And that's really is the Hey Jude Productions and of course where it comes from. Um, so if you're looking for uplifting stories, very many or pretty much all of them relevant to Jewish and, and Israeli subject matter as well. Um, do check those out. I do want to, we got some last moment questions, so I do want to get them in uh, before we end. Uh, first from Sarah Cohen, she says, um, it's amazing that a team that played so closely together with spotlight on them did not know that Alsi was going downhill until he didn't show up for that game. Was there truly no hint that he was struggling really this is for the teammates until that, that time when he was absent? Yeah, I, I asked the team and they did not know until that game. They they didn't know so much that they just believed that he's either sick or he's stuck in traffic or everything. Like every team, there are some hints and moments, but you know, you don't show it in, in, to the outside. But that was really a trigger that the team and everybody looked at the signs that they did have before and put them all together and said, you know, um, we, have, we have a big problem here. So, right. and that's why at the end of that year, Ossi Perry didn't continue with Maccabi Tel Aviv and, you know, he had to, he had to leave. And that was, in my view, the biggest punishment, but also it was probably what saved his life because when he was in jail, he had to go through a rehab and he had to stop using drugs. And even Ossi says that, you know, if not that, he would not be here with us. And there was a question also from um, Marjorie who asked one earlier uh, about uh, what, if anything, is he doing to help other people with addiction problems? So in Israel, he's going to, uh, to young generation and to kids and teach them uh, from his story uh, with the movie and sometimes without the film. And the other thing that also he's doing today is the coach, in, is the coach of the youth of Maccabi. And, um, and he has summer camps uh, that he's doing, you know, every summer. It's one of the most popular basketball summer camps. And what he's doing in that regard is teaching the young generation, you know, don't do my mistakes. You can do better than this. And have, and, 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 the, and one of the things that he likes to say is have a plan B, you know, because athletes sometimes think that the whole world is there, the whole world is in basketball but then their career is finished in pretty young age. And uh, that's something that, you know, many of them take very hard. And we just lost Maradona. And this is an example for somebody that didn't know what to do and didn't have any plan B and suffered from the same thing. On the other hand, you see other guys like Michael Jordan or Karim Abdul-Jabbar that are taking it um, to the positive, you know? So you can choose at the end of the day. You can choose in life. All right, we're going to finish out with two questions. One really quick one from Charles. Um, Charles both asks, is Alsi still in touch with Earl Williams, who played on many U.S. Uh, NBA teams? Not only that Alsi is in touch with Earl Williams, if you have seen the movie, they were together, and they're, they're remembering how Earl Williams went to the stands to hit one of the audience guys. So if you have that question, you have another option to watch the movie again at the Washington Jewish Film Festival. We call it J&J, &J, right? J by J, yeah. J by J, great. Oh, you know that I, I made a movie in, about the, the Jewish Jordan. It's one of, one of the first movie I've done. And it's not far from you guys in Baltimore. And the, the guys used to call him JJ, the, <laughs> the Jewish Jordan, Tamir Goodman. So yeah, you know, that's, Absolutely, he is definitely in touch with the with Earl Williams. Yeah, that that was also one of the most incredible. I'm I'm was surprised when Earl Williams was thrown out of the stands yeah. that he was not more hurt. When I when I saw that at first, I said, "Oh wow, he's gonna have trouble getting up," and he just bounces right back up. Uh, yeah. It was an incredible scene. And then lastly, we were chatting about this just a little bit before we went live. Um, there's some exciting news in DC basketball, and since you follow um, Israeli basketball players, I'd, I'd love it if you could just tell our audience what to expect. There's a, a brand new draft pick that the Wizards have, um, Danny Avdia, who is by far the highest draft pick that's ever come out of Israel. What do we have to look forward to with him? 
Danny is almost spelled like my name, but he's a little bit better than me in basketball. <laughs> and he's just an incredible basketball player. You guys in Washington um, are very lucky uh, because he's very charismatic. He's a wonderful kid. I will give you just an example of how good he is. Israel never won the youth uh, European championship for, uh, in basketball. Uh, the, the team up till 21, uh, which is the team just before the major national team. And with Danny Abdia uh, in the team, we won twice uh, the European Championship for the first time and then for the second time in a row, just because of him. He's just so good. He was the MVP. So um, he's incredible. You know, I mean, if you guys remember Tony Kukuc, some compare him um, to uh, the guy from Dallas, uh, <laughs> you know. Luka Doncic, yeah. Doncic, thank you. Yeah. What happened to me? Uh, but to, to Luka Doncic, I think you know, it, it's a high, it's a very high bar, you know. But he's he's a he's a very good player, you know. So um, I, I'm 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 very happy for you guys uh, to have him there in 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 DC. Please be nice to him. I know he will be nice to you. And I hope that when I come back there, uh, we can maybe show on the map, all see, and, uh, and hosting uh, is, is, is incredible. It's a beautiful vision. Thank you so much, Danny, for the film. For anyone that hasn't seen it, it's still playing through Thursday. Um, and if you haven't seen any of the previous films, highly recommend them all. Great positive stories, both in sports and otherwise. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. And thank you all. Uh, have a great evening. Thank you, Elia. See you next Bye. time. Bye-bye.